All right, we continue on in our study of uh, human genetics and biotechnology. And again, we're studying those two topics together because most biotechnology is being based on human genetics. In general, biotechnology is what, what the title says here, changing the living world. But to change the living world, you have to manipulate DNA. You have to manipulate the genetics of the organism or the genome of the organism. So we're going to start here with uh, a biotechnology that has existed for thousands of years and people have used it for thousands of years most of that time not knowing how it worked or why it worked they just knew it worked and that's selective breeding and i think you're all familiar with selective breeding um, and the the images that i have here just to kind of uh, give some examples of how we have used selective breeding. So these two represent uh, selective breeding in the pet trade or, or selective breeding animals to become companions. Dogs are the best example of that. And just a little aside here, dogs are considered the second most successful mammalian species on the planet. And it's because they uh, have co-evolved along with us and we are the the most successful mammalian species on the planet. So they have kind of tagged along with us to become the most successful duo or team. The snakes here are simply an example of how we have manipulated the coloration um, in the pet trade. So you wouldn't find these in the wild because they're so lightly colored, they wouldn't blend in with their their background with their habitat. They wouldn't be camouflaged and they would be soon eaten uh, after they hatch from their eggs. But in the pet trade, people desire albinos and, and hypomelanistic snakes as we're, we're looking, you know, that's what we're looking at here. Hypomelanistic meaning they have less pigment than they should. Um, and there are all kinds of other color variations that have been created, not only for snakes, but all kinds of species, as you know. Um, and that's simply because people think they're pretty and people want to own unique uh, kinds of animals. We not only um, selectively breed mammals and, and reptiles and, and animals um, for crops and for food, but we also have selectively bred bacteria uh, and microorganisms. Uh, so this photo is just to remind you of that or re to remind us of that. So what is selective breeding? It's choosing only plants and animals with desirable characteristics to reproduce. In other words, if you want to create a certain breed of dog, then you're going to choose the parent dogs that have the characteristics that you want to produce in that breed. And that would be an example of selective breeding. Um, it's also known as artificial selection. So selective breeding and artificial selection are the same thing. And we were, if you'll recall, all the way back at the beginning of the year when we were studying evolution, um, we were looking at artificial selection because it works the same way as natural selection. The only difference between natural selection and artificial selection or selective breeding is what is doing the selecting. In natural selection, it's nature that is doing the selecting, the environment. Um, whereas in artificial selection, it's humans that are doing the selecting. Either way, whether it be natural selection or artificial selection, uh, what's happening is that the evolution of the species is being guided uh, but or changed. But in the case of artificial selection or selective breeding, it's for human purposes. So typically when we uh, carry out artificial selective or selective breeding, it is to produce a species that is useful to us. And we call that a domestic species, a domesticated species. So domestication is the taming or selective breeding of animals and plants for human purposes. Um, and so artificial selection or selective breeding is a big part of domestication. And then pure breeding, um, is the artificial selection of nearly identical individuals that, when crossed, always produce offspring of the same phenotype. So uh, uh, the best example being a dog breed. For example, if you want a purebred bulldog, then you want to cross a purebred mother bulldog and father bulldog so you get a purebred offspring. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of pure breeding. Um, it's also an example of inbreeding, and we'll be taking a look at inbreeding uh, a little further along to uh, discuss the, the, what is not good about in, uh, inbreeding. 
And just a few things about these other images that I didn't uh, mention anything about. Uh, this one has to do with uh, the fact that corn, you know, the corn that we grow, corn on the cob, was not, did not have ears that were as big as what we enjoy today. And the, uh, corn was produced by selective re selectively breeding a species that had very small uh, cobs. Um, and over time, again, over hundreds or, or thousands of years and, and many generations of selectively breeding the corn plant, uh, we produced the, the size of the corn cobs that we have today. This is obviously a, a, a milk cow, a dairy cow, but we've bred dairy cows to produce much more milk than they, that, that, than they naturally did. Um, and it's, it's the same with beef cattle. We selectively bred them to have huge muscles because that's what we eat. So pure breeding is one way that we, we use artificial selective or selective breeding to produce uh, species that we want. Uh, but there's also so, um, hybridization, which is kind of the opposite of selective breeding. So here we're looking at hybridization, and the idea in hybridization is to bring together characteristics of two individuals that you want in their offspring. So for example, if we're talking about uh, tomatoes, and let's say there's a species of tomato that's really sweet but the tomatoes are relatively small. And then there's another species or another uh, type of tomato that produces tomatoes that are really big. They're not very sweet or, or juicy, but they're really big. So you cross those two uh, plants and you end up with tomatoes that are really big and are sweet and juicy. So that's a simple example of hybridization, selectively breeding individuals of different phenotypes and varieties or species to produce uh, the desired result, the desired combination of traits. And it has been used in agriculture to produce crop species like tomatoes that are hardier with increased yield and tomatoes uh, and larger and redder and juicier, just like I was talking about. Um, but this is a <clears throat> an extreme case of where we have used uh, hybridization along with manipulating the ability of the organism, in this case, a, a plant, to uh, produce gametes by meiosis uh, by inducing non-disjunction so that the chromosomes don't come apart properly, if you'll recall, non-disjunction during meiosis. And that produces gametes that are polyploid. They have extra sets of chromosomes. So in this example, um, these two species were crossed, so these are very closely related species, therefore they were able to be hybridized. But that produces a species that is self-incompatible. In other words, it can't reproduce with itself, but it could, can reproduce with this other species that was polyploid. Notice 2N here, that's normal. These are 2N parents producing 2N offspring. Uh, but that species, because it was the result of a hybridization with sterile, which is often the case with hybridization, um, but this species is already was already polyploid, 4N. Notice the 4N designation here. That means four sets of chromosomes instead of two sets of chromosomes. But these were able to be hybridized, hybridized to produce this species that was, that is 3N, which means it has three sets of chromosomes. Well, that's an uneven number, and therefore this species was sterile, not able to produce gametes that could go on and fuse and produce an individual. So what they did then was um, you induce non-disjunction, and that created a species that had six sets of chromosomes, and that ended up being not only fertile, but self-compatible. So in other words, this is a production. All this rigmarole is in the production of a brand new species. So we've been able to manipulate, especially plants, to the point where we've created whole new species through hybridization and also a little bit of uh, induced non-disjunction in this case. And by the way, that can be, uh, in, that can be done by using chemicals that um, inhibit meiosis, inhibit normal cell division and separation of the chromosomes. So manipulation of plants is easier, so to speak. I mean, I know this doesn't look very easy to you, but it turns out that plants can survive 
changes in their chromosome number um, and go on to to reproduce. Um, but in animals, that's not the case. So the typical result of hybridization in animals, closely related animal species, is offspring that are sterile. In other words, not fertile, not able to reproduce. So mules, you may already know that mules are a combination of horse and, and donkeys, and but there are also other hybridized species, ligers and tigans and jag lions and walfins, whale and dolphin hybrids, beefalo, camas, which are llamas and camels, hybridized, zorses, zebras and horses, etc. So we can cross these these two close these closely related species with each other and produce offspring but they uh, are typically sterile not able to reproduce themselves so as i mentioned pure breeding is basically the same thing as inbreeding and inbreeding is the reproduction of closely related individuals and it's often done during selective breeding to produce pure purebred animals or purebred plants or purebred whatever the organism is. But excessive inbreeding can be a problem, a problem for, for populations, a uh, problem for you know purebred dogs. They tend to have certain diseases or disorders that uh, interfere with their health. So excessive inbreeding decreases variation in populations. And as you know, variation is really important in populations, especially natural populations, in order to, you know, because that's how they um, change through natural selection and evolution to be able to adapt to their changing environment. Um, so that's a problem for wild populations. It increases the frequency of recessive phenotypes um, in both wild population and captive populations. So when we pure, pure breed dogs and inbreed dogs, we are increasing the frequency of recessive phenotypes. And that's usually, you know, recessive phenotypes are, are often disorders and and things that are not necessarily desirable. And the reason for that is because closely related individuals and in individuals, so that parents that are closely related to each other are more likely to carry the same recessive alleles. In other words, they're more likely to both be heterozygous and therefore their offspring is likely to be homozygous recessive. So it increases the recessive phenotype or the frequency of the recessive phenotype. So why are we looking at cheetahs on this slide? Well, cheetahs um, have been found to be very genetically similar to each other. So similar that they're almost like all, you know, as close as brother and sister, as close as siblings. And um, it is thought that the reason for that is that at, at one point in the past, cheetahs have undergone a population bottleneck. So a population bottleneck is an event that drastically reduces the size of a population due to some kind of environmental disaster or hunting or habitat destruction or disease. Um, and then the population will rebound, but it will show decreased variation because of the inbreeding that has taken place. And if you'll recall, that's an example of genetic drift, which is a, a, a random change in allele frequency in a population. So these are all random events, disaster, hunting, habitat destruction. Uh, well, hunting, not so much because, you know, but that's human cause. It's not natural um, and, and disease. So the idea here is that the cheetah population today shows little genetic variation, possibly due to a population bottleneck in their evolutionary past resulting from disease. And they speculate that the disease was probably feline immunodeficiency virus, FIV. So just like HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, feline immunodeficiency virus causes AIDS, um, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, um, and that's what they think reduced the, the cheetah population uh, and, and caused a bottleneck. And that's why cheetahs are so genetically similar to each other today. But that's a problem for cheetahs because if the environment changes drastically, like for example, due to climate change or global warming, they may not be able to adapt to those changes. So low genetic diversity in natural populations can be dangerous. They're more likely to be susceptible to a particular disease or a, a particular drastic change in their environment. So we tend to decrease uh, genetic variation by inbreeding or pure breeding um, 
through artificial selection or, or selective breeding, and it can happen naturally by a population bottleneck. Um, but there are also ways that we can increase genetic variation in species. And by doing so, produce completely new uh, phenotypes, completely new traits that the species never had before. And we can do that by inducing mutations. So the ultimate source of genetic diversity, in other words, new genes, where do new genes come from? They come, by, they come from mutating uh, previous genes. So mutation is the ultimate source of genetic diversity. It's where all new genes come from. And if you'll recall, there are two kinds of mutations. There are gene mutations and there are chromosomal mutations. So the example of gene mutations, what we're going to be looking at here in bacteria and chromosomal mutations in the strawberry. So organisms with unique desirable traits have been produced by inducing gene mutations with chemicals or radiation. So for example, we, we can take bacteria and hit them with radiation and that will cause mutations. Then we can take some of those bacteria that were irradiated and put them in a culture that has, uh, that the only food source is oil. And I'm talking like crude oil that comes out of the ground, um, the fossil fuel, you know, like an, in an oil spill. And if some of the individuals, uh, of those bacteria survive, that means they're able to eat the oil. And so in that way, they have been selected um, for, and what has happened is we, we have evolved bacteria that can actually eat oil. And this has been done, and there are now strains of bacteria that have been created in this way that we can use to clean up oil spills. And, and, ha and it, they are being used to clean up oil spills. So that's an example of how we can create gene mutations in organisms. Um, and then again, the strawberry is an example of polyploidy because the strawberries that we eat today are polyploid and they were created to be polyploid. The uh, natural strawberries, and I've got some growing in my backyard, are really teeny tiny. And they really don't taste like much compared to the strawberries we grow now. But we have uh, induced um, non-disjunction and caused gametes to be produced that uh, are actually the gametes are actually diploid instead of being haploid like they're supposed to be so when the sperm fertilizes the egg that produces a polyploid individual and again in plants you can do this in animals you can't but in plants you can and we've used this uh, numerous times to produce crop species that are larger or hardier, you know, able to survive better um, or have other characteristics that are, are, are desirable. So from the wild ancestor, we induced non-disjunction that produced diploid gametes and then that produced uh, polyploid individuals. And strawberries are now polyploid. Polyploidy in animals is usually fatal. In other words, if this happens uh, and the, the sperm fertilizes the egg, that individual would never be born. That, that, that egg will not even typically start development. Or I should say that zygote will typically not even start development. So those are a couple of the basic ways that we've been able to manipulate um, organisms and, and change them in ways that are desirable to us. Uh, selective breeding and, and inducing mutations. But we uh, there are other biotechnologies that are being developed now to manipulate DNA in various ways. And it really starts with extracting DNA. I mean, if you're going to work with DNA, you need to extract the DNA first. So this is the biotechnology of DNA extraction. And it's a relatively simple procedure and it can be done with even things that you can find around the house. Um, so DNA extraction is the isolation of DNA from the nucleus of cells, and it can be extracted from any cell or tissue. So any sample of cells or tissues can, the DNA from those can be extracted. And that goes back to the example that uh, I was using back when we were looking at DNA fingerprinting and that example of where there was a cigarette butt found at the crime scene. On that cigarette butt are cells from the mouth, from the lining of the cheeks, for example. And from those cells, from those few cells, DNA can be extracted. And we're seeing the same thing happening here. Uh, in this case, uh, there's, uh, like a, a mouthwash that is used to um, 
you, you notice his mouth is full, his cheeks are puffed out. So cheek cells are being uh, collected in what he's swishing around in his mouth, and then he spits that into a tube, right? So this is expelled sample that contains cells, mostly cheek cells, uh, from this guy. And then the cells are lysed. Remember, lysis means breaking open. So this is a, a buffer solution that contains detergent. So soap, that's all it is, is soap. And that's, that's what I mean why, uh, by you can, you can find things around the house that will allow you to do DNA extraction yourself. So this is simply a soap solution. And soap, because soap is lipid, it breaks down lipid. It breaks down the cell membranes, right? So what's actually happening here is breaking down the cell membranes. So cell lysis buffer is simply a, a dish detergent to lyse the cells. Um, and protease, notice it ends in ASE, so that's an enzyme, right? And it's an enzyme that breaks down proteins, protease. It's a hydrolytic enzyme. Hydrolytic meaning breaking down, breaking apart. Um, and it breaks it apart with water. That's the hydro part of the, of the, uh, of the term. But what that's doing is breaking down cellular proteins. So note, we're, I mean, what cells are made of mostly are membrane and protein. So we break down the membranes of the cell, we break down the proteins of the cell, and what do you think is going to be left behind? DNA. So then it's basically just mixed up. You invert the tube to mix it up, incubate it at 50 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes, and uh, that allows for the protease to work. So the solution's incubated because that's the optimum temperature for the protease activity. And then uh, ice-cold alcohol. And again, that's something that you can readily buy at the, uh, at the uh, drugstore. And you might even have some, some around the house. But it needs to be cold, ice-cold. Um, and you, you pour that in very carefully. You add it very carefully over the top of the solution, the DNA solution, so that it forms a layer because alcohol will float on water. Alcohol is less dense than water. So it pr produces a layer on top of the aqueous solution. Um, and then you just let it sit for a while and the DNA will precipitate out. Now, precipitate, what the heck does that mean? Well, a, a precipitate is a substance that is deposited in solid form from a solution. In other words, it's something that goes from being dissolved to coming out of the solution and no longer being dissolved and uh, forming a solid again. So DNA dissolves in aqueous solution, and that's what we have here. But when we add the alcohol, it's not soluble in alcohol. So in ice cold alcohol, it precipitates. It comes out of the aqueous solution and is not dissolved anymore. So then it's mixed up again to, just to make sure it's all precipitated. But what's left in the tube then is a solution that contains pretty much nothing but DNA, solid DNA, which looks like white strands. But that's a relatively small amount of DNA because it just came from a few cells. So typically to work with the DNA and, and do something with, an, with the DNA, it needs to be, as we say, amplified. And the way that's done is through a tool known as PCR, polymerase chain reaction. That's how a little bit of DNA can be copied, basically, to produce a lot of DNA. So polymerase chain reaction, PCR, is a technique used to make multiple copies. You, it, you could also say clones of a sequence of DNA. And it's very precise. And it can be used to amplify. And again, that's the term that I, I previously used. So this is typically referred to as amplification of the DNA, but it just means copy. And it's copying a very specific target sequence from a mixture of DNA. So you can have, you know, like a whole genome from somebody in the mixture and only target and copy a certain gene or a certain sequence of DNA from that whole mixture. And in a nutshell, what it is, is artificial DNA replication. If you understand DNA replication, then you understand basically how PCR works. And at this point, you should understand DNA replication or remember how DNA replication works. So, of course, this is carried out in a container. So it may be a, a vial similar to what we were seeing on the previous slide, or it could be a beaker. But you start off by putting all the ingredients into that container. So we're just going to list the ingredients here. So what you add to the container 
is the DNA sequence you want to copy, of course. DNA primers that are very specific. In other words, these are artificially produced sequences of DNA um, that are going to function as primers, and we'll take a look at what those primers do in a minute. Uh, DNA polymerase, ACE, right? That's the enzyme that polymerizes DNA. That's the same enzyme that uh, polymerizes the DNA back when we were studying DNA uh, replication. But this is a special kind of DNA polymerase that came from thermophilic bacteria. So this is thermophilic DNA polymerase. Thermophilic, if you'll recall, means heat loving. So these are from heat loving bacteria and this DNA polymerase evolved to function at very high temperatures. And if uh, you'll notice here that temperature is an important part of this. So that's why we're using this special kind of DNA polymerase that works at higher temperatures than the, D the uh, DNA polymerase found in our own cells, which functions at 37 degrees Celsius uh, or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the last thing is DNA nucleotides. If you're going to copy DNA, that means you, there, there has to be nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA to, uh, to build new DNA. So you would add nucleotides of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, if you'll recall. So back on the topic of these DNA primers, because that's really the key here in, uh, in copying the sequence of DNA, the specific se sequence of DNA that we want to copy. So DNA primers are short, single DNA polynucleotides. In other words, they're not double. Usually DNA is a double helix, right? Well, these are single DNA polynucleotides, single strands. And they provide what's known as the three prime end, that three with a um, comma, not comma, um, apostrophe, um, is read as three prime. Um, and so you'll notice up here in the diagram, one end of a polynucleotide is three prime and the other end is five prime. And we're not gonna get into the details of uh, what that's all about. But what you do need to note is that new nucleotides can only be added to the three prime end of a DNA molecule, of a DNA poly, a growing DNA polynucleotide. So that's what DNA polymerase, that's the only thing that DNA polymerase can add nucleotides to is the three prime end. So these primers are necessary to give DNA polymerase a three prime end to be able to add nucleotides to. Um, and they're specific and bracket the DNA sequence of interest. So this is the DNA sequence of interest, but notice that there is a primer that is specifically has the specific sequence to bind to the sequence at, at the three prime end of this sequence that we want to copy. And there's a primer that has a sequence that is complementary to the sequence of the uh, other end that we want to copy. So in that way, they bracket the sequence that, that we want to copy from one end to the, to the other and from on one strand and the other. So then what happens is what's known as thermocycling. So poly polymerase chain reaction thermocycle is what's being shown in this, this diagram. And so we start by heating the DNA and that causes it to, that causes the two strands to come apart, denature. Just like that term that we use to talk about uh, the change in a protein, the shape of a protein when it gets warm, like the, the shape of an enzyme, and the enzyme won't function anymore because it, is, it has denatured. Well, they use the same term to refer to the DNA strands separating from each other. So at 95 degrees Celsius, which is pretty hot, the DNA strands denature, they separate from each other. Then it's allowed to cool down to about 50 to 70 degrees Celsius, and that allows the primers to go ahead and anneal, as we say, which simply means bind. And, and if you'll recall, um, the nitrogenous bases are going to bind to each other by hydrogen bonding, which is relatively weak. So that's why heating it can separate those hydrogen bonds relatively easy. Uh, and then letting it cool will allow those hydrogen bonds to reform again. But because the primers are there, the primers are, go are going to uh, bind with the DNA strands instead of the DNA strands coming back together again. And then 
it's heated up again. It's warmed up again to the temperature at which polymerase, uh, the DNA polymerase operates best, the optimum temp temperature for DNA polymerase, this thermophilic DNA polymerase. And that's when new nucleotides then are added to the three prime end of the primers and both of them on both strands. So we have new nucleotides being built at the three prime end of the primer on this strand. We have new nucleotides being added to the three prime end of the primer on this strand. And that's how we end up with a copy of the DNA sequence that we want to copy. So every time it thermocycles, thermocycles, every time this repeats, and that's what they're getting across here with these numbers, we just go from heating to cooling to warming. Every time we heat, cool, warm, heat, cool, warm, that's a thermocycle, and that doubles the amount of DNA. So just repeat this over and over and over, and th there's a machine that does that, just constantly heats, cools, warms, heats, cools, warms, and every time it heats, cools, and warms, it doubles the amount of DNA, sort of. Um, and I put sort of there because it is actually a little bit more complicated than that. It's not exactly doubling DNA with every thermal cycle, at least at the beginning especially, but we don't need to get into those details. But that's PCR, and this has been a great tool because you can take a little bit of DNA, a very teeny tiny bit of DNA, and make as much of it as you want. Copy it as many times as you need. So again, we're talking about manipulating DNA here, and so now that we have enough DNA through PCR, we need to be able to cut it. If you're going to manipulate DNA, you need to be able to cut the DNA. So restriction enzymes are what do that. And if you'll recall, I already introduced the uh, concept of restriction enzymes back when we were looking at DNA fingerprinting. Um, and so the way they work is that they cut very specific DNA sequences at a very specific place or in a very specific way. And where we got them is from bacteria, as I told you before. They act as an immune system against bacteriophages. If you'll recall, bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria, and they inject their uh, genome, they inject their genetic material into the bacteria, and the bacteria, uh, the, the restriction enzymes in the bacteria, will recognize that bacteriophage DNA and chop it up. That's, that's the job of the restriction enzymes in the bacterial cell, is to chop up invading DNA, DNA that's not supposed to be in there. And in that way, it acts as an immune system and protects the bacteria against bacteriophages. Well, we've been able to harness these restriction enzymes and use them as a tool to do the same thing, cut up the DNA. But what makes them useful is that they're very specific. They are very specific in where they cut. So they will only cut when they find what's known as a recognition sequence. So this is the recognition sequence of ECHO R1, which is the same restriction enzyme we were looking at back when we were uh, learning about uh, DNA fingerprinting. So the recognition sequence here is CTTAAG. And notice that it's palindromic, meaning that on the other strand, it's the same sequence, just in the opposite direction, CTTAAG, right? That's significant. Um, because both strands will be cut. Because of that, both strands will be cut. And ECHO R1 specifically cuts between the A and the G of that sequence. So in both sequences, it'll find that sequence. It recognizes that sequence. That's why it's known as a recognition sequence. Once it recognizes that sequence, it will cut at what's known as the restriction site. And then again, in this case, the restriction site is between the A and the G within that sequence on both strands between the A and the G. So there's a restriction site on this strand between the A and the G and a restriction site on this strand between the A and the G. And since we're using, uh, well, ECHO R1, wherever it finds that sequence, that recognition sequence in the strand of DNA or in the DNA molecule, it's going to cut it. So there's a restriction site here and a restriction site here. And the result is that the bonds are going to be broken, both the hydrogen bonds that hold the two strands together and the phosphodiester bonds that hold nucleotides together. If you'll recall, the, the uh, blue here is representing the backbone of the DNA. In other words, the sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And between the sugar and phosphate, between two nucleotides, 
is what's known as a phosphodiester bond. So that's what's bonding the nucleotides together side, side by side. And then the strands are being uh, held together or bonded together by hydrogen bonding between the nitrogenous bases, between the A's and T's and G's and C's. All right, if you'll recall. Now, here's where the magic is. So because many of these restriction enzymes cut, uh, make a staggered cut, what I'm referring to here is a staggered cut in the DNA, that's referred to as a sticky end. In other words, these nucleotides are hanging out here at the end and they're not bound to anything. And the other piece of DNA has um, a sequence that's complementary to that. If these were allowed to, they could rebind back together again. But as long as you cut DNA with the same restriction enzyme, they will always have complementary sticky ends. And you'll be able to, no matter you know where that DNA come from, came from, whether it came from a human or whether it came from bacteria, if you cut the DNA with the same restriction enzyme, you'll be able to join those DNA molecules together. So you'll be able to combine DNA from humans and bacteria, for example. So that's what I'm saying here when I say remember this for genetic engineering, because what I just described is basically what happens in genetic engineering. We use the restriction enzyme to cut a gene from a human and splice it into the genome of a bacteria. But we use the same restriction enzyme to cut the DNA from the human and cut the DNA from the bacteria so that we can put them back together again, because they're going to have complementary sticky ends. As long as you use the same restriction enzyme, you're going to have complementary sticky ends on those DNA fragments and you'll be able to put them together in any way that you like. So it's a very powerful tool. The final tool we're looking at here is gel electrophoresis, which is the same gel electrophoresis that we were looking at back when we were looking at DNA fingerprinting or learning about DNA fingerprinting. And that's what's happening here too, is DNA fingerprinting. So this is basically uh, just a little more detail about how gel electrophoresis works. And the reason that you need to know about it is because it is such a useful tool in, in genetic manipulation and in, in, um, biotechnology. So gel electrophoresis is a technique to separate proteins or DNA fragments according to size and charge. Now, what we're looking at here is, is the separation of DNA fragments, but also note that you can separate proteins out this way too. So DNA is obtained by DNA extraction, which we just looked at a couple slides ago, so you know how DNA extraction is done. Then that DNA is amplified by PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which is something that we were looking at a couple slides ago also, so you're familiar with that. And then we treat it with restriction enzymes, which is what we were looking at on the previous slide. So notice that this tool depends on the previous three tools that we learned about. Um, so this all goes together. So a, a good uh, test question, for example, would be to have you explain how uh, DNA fingerprinting works all the way from the beginning at DNA extraction all the way to the end when we have a final gel here to analyze. So as I described previously, the gel is made of highly purified agarose, which is agar for short, and it comes from algae. It's the same stuff that we used in the bottom of a petri dish when we were growing bacteria uh, in, in that cell culture lab. But they can also use what's known as polyacrylamide. And that would be uh, in a system known as PAGE, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, PAGE. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you know that agarose isn't the only thing we use for uh, gel electrophoresis, but both of them are semi-solids. In other words, they're gels. They're composed of mostly water and they're very porous so that molecules are able to migrate through them. And that's what the arrows are showing here, the migration of molecules through the gel. So the purpose of the power source here is to set up an electrical field across the gel. And both DNA and proteins, so whether we're separating out DNA fragments or proteins, both of them are negatively charged. So we place the DNA into sample wells at the, at the negative end of the gel and they will migrate because they're in an electrical field, they will migrate, or when they're in an electrical field, they will migrate towards the positive electrode or the anode um, because opposites attract. 
the, the negatively charged DNA is going to be attracted to the positive electrode and it's going to migrate through the gel because it's in that powerful electrical field. And as it migrates, it's going to separate out. The different size fragments are going to separate out where the shorter fragments move farther because they move faster and the longer, long, longer fragments are, are farther back on the gel because they move more slowly through the, through their gel. The other thing to point out is they're not showing that uh, this would be in a chamber that's under aqueous solution. So the gel is actually submerged in aqueous solution when this happens. And that's the reason for that is because you have to have uh, that aqueous solution for the electricity to pass through. Um, so like I said, the mixture of DNA fragments, it migrates through the gel. Smaller fragments travel faster, so they end up moving farther. And the fragments are, are separated according to their length, according to their size. And where you can get this DNA is any cell or tissue. You can even get it from fossils. I mean, that's one of the big things that's going on now in paleontology is to try to get uh, DNA samples from fossils and be able to sequence that DNA and, and uh, then compare sequences of once living species to the present species. So again, it can be used to identify and purify proteins, that uh, identify genes, That's what, that would be in genetic testing, sequence DNA, which is something we'll be looking at next time, identify individuals, in other words, DNA fingerprinting, which is what we were looking at before, and, and basically what this is. The pattern of the bands here represent uh, DNA fingerprints. Use it to determine relationships between people, in other words, paternity, for example, like who the father is. Like you see on TV all the time, they're doing paternity tests, DNA tests to find out who the father is. And to make comparisons between species, like I just mentioned, like for uh, once living species, extinct species from fossils, but also living species like comparing human and chimpanzee DNA. And that's how we know that we're less than 2% different from chimpanzees. So um, just to remind you, the DNA fingerprints here, what we're looking at are differences in the length of the fragments that were produced from restriction enzymes. So what we're looking at here are what are known as restriction fragment length polymorphisms. Differences in the fragments, that's the polymorphism part, differences in the length of the fragments that were produced from restriction enzymes. So restriction fragment length polymorphism, polymorphisms, RIFLIPS. So like I suggested a minute ago, try to put these tools together so that you can understand the scenario here of how these all kind of fit together. From DNA extraction through PCR amplification, then treating with the restriction enzymes and separating out those fragments to find the, the RIFLIPS, the restriction fragment length polymorphisms.